Father, we are very grateful this morning for the privilege of sonship. We know that you have been good to us. There's no doubt about it. It's amazing that one month has gone already in this new year. Thank you for your faithfulness that we have enjoyed and that we have even begun to enjoy this new year, this new month. Even today, we can declare that great is your faithfulness. Thank you for your eternal word. A lamp onto our feet, light on our path. Speak, we ask. Help us to see what you are saying, how those things apply to our lives today. And thank you for the blessings and benefits of the gospel as we confirm your word into our lives with signs following. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Turn with me your Bibles, please, for now, to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 8. I'm going to be reading quite a bit today, but uh, let's start from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore or promised to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. We're talking about your promised land. We started to talk about this along these lines from last Sunday, and by God's grace, we'll be concluding today. As we saw last Sunday, God has a promised land in mind for you. He wants you to know about it. He wants you to enter it. He wants you to enjoy it for long, and he wants you to leave it behind for your children. So let me read the one eight again. See, I've set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. We don't live in the Old Testament today, but we learn from the Old Testament. The scriptures teach that clearly. We saw this last Sunday. So if you are in here, take advantage of technology, and you can... Uh, go back to it so you can get the full details. But as we have seen, it's a journey. The promised land is a journey. It might not be a physical, geographical place like it was for the children of Israel, but it's a GRA, a God-reserved area for all of us. It's not heaven because Moses is in heaven today, but he didn't enter the promised land. So there's a place on earth, not heaven. It's a place of fulfillment. It's a place where things will be what you dreamt about and beyond. And as we have said, you'll be there for long and leave it for your own children as well. Can you please say amen? amen. To, to enter that promised land, we saw last week, you must start with a promise. I mean, that makes sense to talk about a promised land that will have to be a promise. And that promise can be from the Holy Bible. It can be from God's dream to you. It can be from a message you receive. I mean, however God gets it across to you, so long as it does not go against the Bible, both the letter and the teachings of the Bible. So it's not necessarily just one verse of scriptures. It might be a composite picture of a life that God has in mind for you, for your future, from many scriptures. You can, it's not the same thing everybody sees in the Bible. I can read the Bible, I can read the Bible, we can read the same place, and what's going to come across to me personally will probably be different from what will come across to you personally. So it might not be one verse, for some it might be one verse, might not be one verse, might be a composite picture that you have of the future that God has in mind for you, but the important thing must be so clear and definite, as we saw last week, God could say to Moses, that's the land, I promise, that's the place, you won't get there, but that's it, it's, it's clear, it's definite, and you can see it. So it has to be something that way, that is concrete. You must start with a promise. Secondly, we saw that you must search out the land. To enter it, you must search it out. So in a sense, you have to see it or get there before you get there. God could tell Abraham from where you are, look northward, southward, westward, eastward, and everything you see, I will give. So he had to see it before. He wasn't even the one who got there his generations after, but he had to see it as we seen first. You probably have heard the story of Disney World in Orlando, where well, Disney had died before it started before they moved into it. And the person who I'm used to Christian things, so I'll say dedicated, but what would they call it now? Is it inauguration? Whatever. The person who declared it open, yeah, I think that's a better way to put it, was saying, what a pity that Walt is not here today and he didn't get to see this. And his wife had to say, he saw it. That's why we're here. That makes sense. He saw it. He's because he saw it before time that he put it in place and he said, she said, that's why we're here. You are saying what a pity he didn't see it. It's because of what he saw that all of us are here now. And that's what we are talking about. A place that you will see that even those after you we continue to enjoy. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. So you must search out the land. I don't like that hallelujah. It's standing on only one leg. Can you please shout hallelujah? Yeah. So a place that you will see clearly 
And uh, as we have seen, you have to search it out. You have to get there before you get there. You have to see it before. So different ways, as we have seen, maybe through books, maybe through formal education, maybe through informal education, we all ought to keep learning. All of us ought to keep learning. Like I said, it's a journey, you see. So wherever you are now, there's still a better place than where you are as long as you live. All right? So it might be through mentors, you know, and you, you don't have to know somebody physically before they mentor you. You can be mentored through their materials and so on and so forth. So you need to get there before you. So we all ought to be researching along some lines. The direction we believe God is taking us because things that have been are things that shall be. There's nothing we want to become that others haven't become before. The specifics will be different, but the generalities will be the same. So all of us ought to be researching some things along the lines we believe God is taking us. Otherwise, we will never get there. We will never get there. So start with the promise. Secondly, start out the land. Thirdly now, we are going on today, survive distractions. To enter your promised land you need to survive distractions. There are many distractions on route to the promised land. When you are on the way to the place God has in mind for you, a place of refreshing, a place of abundance, a place of freedom, a place of plenty, there are many distractions along the way. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, let's read from verse 13. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, God speaking to Moses, telling Israel, when you get to the promised land, everything is hunky-dory, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you, is verse 15 we're really interested in, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land, where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do you good in the end. I like that, to do you good in the end. But there are many distractions. So, God referred to the wilderness as great and terrible. As we head for the promised land, we are going to navigate a world where great and terrible things happen. All kinds of things that can distract you if one is not careful. But when God brings us through it, it should do us good in the end. That's why we are coming to the promised land. Not too long ago, the Pope who some erroneously think is the head of Christianity in the world, he's just the head of the Catholic Church, you see. He said that priests could start to bless same-sex marriage. And some people tried to adjust it for him. They were embarrassed. Because the Catholic Church teaches the infallibility of the Pope. He can't say something wrong if he's talking along lines of morals. So how, how can he say that? So they were trying to help him butter it up. And then the man came and said it again the second time. And he said, the whole world we get to see that what he's saying is true, except for Africans. How many people read it? I said, I said, because he goes against African culture. I said, thank God there's something good that they are knowing about Africans. So he said it at one time. They were trying to help him, but I thought, no. He didn't quite say that, but the man said it. So anybody who believed in the infallibility of the Pope before should know now that uh, the Pope is just like any regular human being who might not be born again at all. But that's the world we live in, you see. That's the world we live in. Everybody will get to see. So why people agree with it is not as important as God's standard. The economy of this country is enough to distract. The state of insecurity right now, there's so many things, great and terrible wilderness. So a lot can cause distractions. You must survive distractions to get to your promised land. In, um, let's read Mark chapter 4 from verse 18. Mark chapter 4 from verse 18. You know that popular parable of Jesus is about four different kinds of land. That's probably the most popular of his parables in all the gospels, you know. And uh, just like Psalm 23 is probably the commonest psalm. So the most known one about those four different kinds of land, remember? And then one of the kinds of land Verse 18, Mark 4. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, take note of that, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires or loss for other things, enter in, choking, enter in, choke the word, I beg your pardon, and it becomes unfruitful. So see some kinds of things that can cause destruction. Cares of this world. You may say natural cares. There are cares that you live in Nigeria, especially there are cares. 
cares of this world. And you see, riches can be deceitful. Riches can deceive you. When there's money in your pocket, you can be deceived. So some things are some ways when they're not so. And then desires for other things choke in the world, and the world becomes unfruitful. You have to survive distractions. We were talking about Caleb and Joshua last Sunday. They entered the promised land. An entire generation, only they entered the promised land. So there were all kinds of things that happened. For instance, there was a time there was a presumptuous move. They said, let's go. You know, we have let's go. Right, right. Moses said, don't go. God is not with you. He's not going with you. The ark is going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. Hey, we are going. They went and they were defeated. Caleb and Joshua didn't join that presumptuous move. When there was rebellion, Korah, Dutton, and Abraham and Co., they didn't join them. They didn't join when there was immorality with Midianites. They didn't allow those things to distract them. We all know that when you are distracted, it means you are taking your focus away from where you should be going. There are so many things that are available in today's world. The internet. There are people's homes have been destroyed simply because of the internet. Nothing would have been wrong with the relationship ordinarily. Why not for time that one chooses to spend so much time online and doesn't have time for it? And you, you, you know what? I, I'm seeing that the, the generation after us, because of things online, many of them have missed out on real relationships because of relationships online. They need to be careful, don't you think? And even our own generation needs to be careful as well. Some people spend so much time online now that they don't spend time. Just anywhere you go to any restaurant, just look at people there. People are eating together, but everybody's on the device, including the person talking. Everybody's looking at something. Human beings are with you that you should be talking to. And then everybody is holding something and looking at something. Instead of real life relationships, we're all somewhere else. So you can be seated next to each other. Many years ago, my wife and I chose. Now at the point, at the particular time of the day, we are not going to pick the phone. We will talk to each other. Even when our children call them, we don't pick the phone. So, oh, okay, they will remember. So, okay, your love time. So we jokingly say, what's the rest of the time? If you say it's love time, is it hatred time? But we have just decided that at least there must be a time that won't pick the phone. And when the time is up, we reach for our phones again. See? That's the kind of world we live in today. We need to guard our relationships jealously. Because there are so many things that can distract. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Alternatives can distract. You know, when there are so many alternatives, if you have only two shirts, you know what to wear, don't you? You know what you wore yesterday, so you know what you're going to wear today. But when you have 45, so alternatives can distract. Maybe I still have enough time to read a few scriptures here. Exodus 8.25. You know, when they were going to the promised land, they were telling... Uh, Moses was telling Pharaoh, God said we should go. We're going to sacrifice to our God. And then, no, I don't know the Lord you're talking about. Neither will I let Israel go. And gradually, he began to soften his stance when he saw the power of God. And he would give an alternative. And Moses would say no. And then he would give another alternative. And Moses would say no. So, you see, alternatives are enough to distract you from going into your promised land. Exodus said 25. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go, sacrifice to your God in the land. Moses said, it's not right to do so. For we will sacrifice so. He gave him an alternative, okay, okay, go and sacrifice, do what you want, but let it happen in the land. He said, no. Verse 28, so Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far. So you see, he had just it again, don't go far. Okay, go, leave the land, but don't go far. Again, Moses said, no, you can read all this later. Chapter 10, verse 11. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire, and they were driven. So at first, in the land. When they refuse, okay, not far away. Then later, okay, okay, let only the men go. She said, no. Then, verse 24, of the same place, he said he should leave the animals behind. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, not a hoof shall be left behind. So alternatives can distract. Anything that can make us to shift our gaze and focus from where we believe God is taking us, it might seem nice enough, might seem okay enough. Alternatives can distract. Even our own personal desires can distract. There are times that what we want isn't what God wants, but we just like it. You know, there are things we like, but we better know there's a difference between what we like or what we desire and where God wants us to go. Even the things we like can distract us. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 2 from verse 4. And command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. What was God saying? I have not given you their land. The promised land is a promised land. It's not every land that's a promised land. So you will go there, don't take their land. If you read verse 9 later, God was saying, you can't take the land of the Ammonites. I've given that to the tenants of Lot. Verse 19, you will see the same kind of thing. So God was saying, you will come across things that you may have a natural likeness for that will seem like a good idea, but not every good idea is God's idea. Maybe I should say that again. Not every good idea is God's idea. Not everything that works is God's plan for you as a person. So, I've not given you the land of Edom. I've not given you the land of Anon. I've not given you the land of, of Moab. No. Those are reserved for the descendants of Lord. So, it's not every land you see. It's not every land you are able or capable or have the knowledge to take that God wants you to have as a person. You see why we must search it out and work with God specifically. Even legitimate things can distract. Family life, going to work, all those things can distract. First Corinthians 7 from verse 32. We are saying survive distractions. That's the point we are making. Don't forget. First Corinthians 7 from verse 32. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about things of the world, how he may please his wife. That's the difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So normal family life can distract one. That you are married can distract you, and that you are single can also distract you. So to enter my promised land, I must survive distractions. Can you please say that? To enter my promised land, I must survive distractions. Please say it again. To enter my promised land, I must survive distractions. So habits can distract, relationships can distract, choices can distract, hobbies can distract. Anything you can imagine, if you allow it, can distract. I find it instructive in Leviticus 18 from the first verse. Let's read. God said this to Israel. Leviticus 18 from the first verse. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I beg your pardon. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, you shall not do. According to the doings of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. Ah, ah. Where you are coming from, don't behave like that. Where you are going, don't behave like that. Ah, there am I to behave. It tells us there clearly. From verse 4, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. So to get to my promised land, I'm not to live according to where I'm coming from, according to where I'm going. I'm to live based on God's word. If I want to get to my promised land, God's word must be my standard. God's word must be my yardstick. God's word must be my boundary. God's word must be my reality. No matter what appears good and okay and working for others, I must never take my focus off God's word. So I want to ask you a simple question. Are you focused on the land God is taking you? Are you walking in that direction? Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1. We all know it. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, the race set before us. Not the race we choose. The one set before us. Looking unto Jesus. That means looking exclusively on Jesus. Looking away from all else that can distract. Looking on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So the secret of Jesus' endurance on the cross was to keep something in view. He set that joy ahead of him, despising the shame, because shame could have distracted him, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So real life is not a sprint. Real life is a marathon. It's a marathon. In a sprint, within seconds, it's over. 
But in marathon, you go up, you come down, you go here, there, you enter water, you come out and climb, heal, you are dirty sometimes, you are clean sometimes, everything's eventually. So number one, start with a promise. Number two, search out the land. Number three, survive distractions. Say with me, there is a promised land for me on earth. Say, I know about it. I will enter it. Say, I will enjoy it. I will leave you for my seat to come. Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but things which are revealed belong unto us and unto our children. What is working for us, we work for God, who say, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three generations at the same time. Lastly, slog it out. Firstly, start with the promise. Secondly, search out the land. Thirdly, survive distractions. And lastly, slog it out. When you say slog it out, it means fight. Fight. If you don't want to fight, you might as well quit. Very instructive that those who are counted in the Old Testament, you, you probably have seen the number of people counted, and uh, you may have thought maybe just 603,550 people. Those were just the men who could fight. They were just younger than 20. They were those older than 50. They were women. They were children. So it's believed that the number of people Moses led out of Egypt were more than 2 million people. But Let's read Numbers chapter 1 from verse 2. Take a census of all the congregation of children of Israel by their families, by their father's houses, according to the number of their names, every male individually from 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Who are they to count? Those who are able to go to war. In other words, if you are not fighting, you are not worth being counted. Let's see it again. Chapter 26, verse 2. Numbers 26, 2. Take a census of all the congregation of children of Israel from 20 years old and above by their father's houses, all who are able to go to war in Israel. So those counted were the ones able to go to war. So if you are not able to go to war, you don't deserve to be counted. I think that's instructive. If we are talking about taking the promised land, we have to fight it out. Judges 3 from verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. Namely, and then names were mentioned. So God was saying, in other words, you have to know how to fight. If you want to follow me, if you want to become all, you have to, you have to learn to fight. You just must know to fight. So fighting is a normal way. But may I say straight away that the Bible tells us the New Testament because they all they fought physical wars. In the New Testament, the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Tell your neighbor, fight the good fight of faith. Please tell somebody else, if you're in another fight, please tell somebody, if you're in another fight, Apart from the fight of faith, you are in the wrong fight. Yeah. Tell somebody else, it's the fight of faith that we are meant to fight. If you are fighting any other fight, it's a wrong fight. You fight the good fight of faith, lay it on eternal life. Second Timothy chapter 4 from verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. See, the same thing. Very important. And if I may point out to you, even in the Old Testament, that they fought physical battles, it was still a fight of faith they were to, to fight. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. I said I'm going to be reading many places in the Bible. Deuteronomy 21. When you go out to battle against your enemies, that's important. God did not say if, he said when. So it's not a matter of tabishu <laughs> Yeah. Not if you find out when, he said. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you do, do not be afraid of them. That's not normal. That's not natural. Because when you see that you are outnumbered, you'll be afraid. When you are going to fight and you see that they have more soldiers, they have more chariots, they have more horses, the natural thing is to be afraid. Now God said, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots, so don't close your eyes, you can see them, and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord your God is with you. That changes everything. Say, God is with me. 
uh, I don't know if you believe it. Say, God is with me. Please say it again. God is with me. That's powerful. He said, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you go, when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to people and so on and so forth. Here's the point. You are going to war. You are Kali, Olubumburu, Daga, Saul, whatever you are to fight with. And you can see that they are more in number. They have more weapons than you. You should be afraid. So why is it a fight of faith? The issue is God is with you. Can you see him? No. Can you see the enemies? Yes. Can you see their weapons? Yes. Can you see God? No. But believe that he's with you. Believe that he's the one who will do the fighting. You are going to show up, but your victory will not be because of what you have. It will be because of God with you. So it was always a fight of faith. So when Israel won wars, it was never because of their number. That's when, when, when David decided to count how many soldiers he had. Uh, and Joab was saying, uh, they don't want, don't catch it. Who is the king? And God wanted him to see that it's not because of your number. So whatever option he picked out of three punishments, it will have reduced the number of the people to let him know, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. To let him know, some trust in chariots and horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. To let him know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, all your ways, acknowledge him. So, talking about slogging it out or fighting, we're talking about the fight of faith. As we have seen, there are no giants in heaven to fight, so heaven is not the promised land, it's on earth. But we must dispossess the land. We must dispossess the land. The land isn't empty now, just waiting. There's no vacuum in nature. There's no place that's just empty land, you know, and uh, nothing is growing there and all of that. So that's why we must learn to fight. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Live on time. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not physical, but they are mighty through God. So a Christian who doesn't know how to wage war with God's war, who doesn't know how to wage war in the place of prayers, is not going to get to the promised land. It's as simple as that. Numbers 33, 53. Numbers 33, 53. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. You know, I, I like the songs we sang. I was amusing myself where it's hard when I was listening to them that they didn't just say, if you dance. Because when he said, if you dance, just dance, they got to come down. Dancing before giant. The same way David danced before Goliath, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God they said, God is going to do the fighting. Thank God they said, concerning prayer. Thank God they said, concerning worship, concerning praise. Thank God they talked about shouting. Uh -huh. So if you now dance, okay, fine. But if you just dance, dance and see. They got to come down. Are you just dancing? <laughs> We will see who will come down. So we must dispossess the land. I read Psalm chapter 2 earlier. I don't want to read it now to gain time. But when you get home, please read that chapter. You will see that the Bible refers to Edom. The Bible refers to Ammon. The Bible refers to Moab. And refers to giants who occupied the lands that they were in before. That God dispossessed those lands and they could enter before it happened to Israel. So it tells us that's God's way. That's God's way. You will dispossess the land. So it wasn't just Israel that God dealt with that way. Happened also for Moab. Happened also for Ammon. Happened also even before it happened for Israel. Tell your neighbor, you better realize you will dispossess your land. So let me ask you, are you fighting any war now? And I'm talking about a fight of faith. Is there a place beyond where you are now that you believe God for? that you are able to stretch yourself and stand your ground in faith for it to happen. Numbers 21 from verse 33. Numbers 21 from verse 33. And they turned and went up by the way to Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people to battle at Edre. Then the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him. You, you notice this do not fear it keeps coming out in, in warfare. Just the same way that you need faith for victory, fear will ensure defeat. So a Christian who chooses to be afraid instead of operating by faith can be defeated. Do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand with all his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of Amorites. The man was still standing. War had not been fought yet. The man was a giant. If you read further down, you will see the size of his bed. The man was a giant. His bed size was maybe 13 and a half by, by 6 feet. I, I don't know how big your bed is, 7 by 6 or something. That's how huge that man was. 
And while he was still alive, why no bow or arrow had been fired? God was saying, I've given you this land. I've given you the people. And that's what God is saying to you today. I have given you your promised land. Deuteronomy 3 from verse 8. And at that time we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were on this side of the Jordan. From the river Anon to Mount Hermon, Sidonians called them blah, 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 the cities of the place, so on and so forth. Okay. Let me just leave, leave it basically saying the same thing and that's where actually the size of the bed of the man is. So fight for your marriage, fight for your children, fight for your career, fight for your ministry, fight for your business. Whatever direction you believe God is taking you because the enemy will contest it. Because there are giants who will try to oppose you, who will try to hinder it, who will try for you to get there. So you must fight a fight of faith. We're not talking about never sleeping at night. We're not talking about being afraid. We're talk not talking about uh, looking as though something is wrong with you. That people have to ask you every second, hope all is well. No. We're talking about because God said something and you are taking hold of that word and insisting on it's happening in your life. And no devil can stop it. So where are you pushing now? Where are you pressing now? It's around me 7 from verse 17. You tell me 7 from verse 17. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. See it again. But you shall remember well that the Lord your God did to Pharaoh. Excuse me. You shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. I want to ask you a question. Has God given you victory before? I want to ask you another question. Has God healed your body before? I want to ask you a question. Have you overcome any unsurmountable issue before in your life? Can I ask you a question? Have you ever seen God's faithfulness in the past? So no matter what faces you now, or no matter what may face you in the future, since you know the end of the matter from what God is saying now, don't say, how can I do this? How will I pay the fees? How will it come about? How will this idea be fulfilled? How so and so? Hear it again. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. But you shall remember where. So, the God who did it before. You know the problem? Sometimes we are too intelligent. Sometimes we know too much for our own good. Just knowing simply that Jesus the same, yesterday, today, and forever. No, 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 pastor, you don't understand. The details are, makes no difference. Jesus the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Did he win before? Yes. Will he win today? Yes. Will he win tomorrow? Hallelujah. Can somebody shout hallelujah? That's all you need to know. So Caleb was speaking to Joshua in Joshua chapter 14 from verse 6. Joshua 14 from verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb son of Jephune the Kenizai said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kalispanian. We say you must start with the word. He held on to that word all his life. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. I did not allow myself to be distracted, if you like. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now... Behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Glory to God. No matter what, challenges against your health, challenges against your marriage, challenges against whatever. He said, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on that day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out of coming. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. He went on saying, they said the Anakims are there. If God is with me, I will see. He was still ready to fight. When you are through fighting, you are through living. As long as you live, if you know there's a place that God is taking you, you must slog it out. That's what God is getting out of your day. See, every journey in life is risky. We have said it's a journey. Every journey is risky. Our confidence is because of God who is going with us. Not just that he's with us, he's in us. You know, in the Old Testament, we have seen that God was with them. But he's also in us in the New Testament. First John 4, 4. You have got little children, I have overcome them. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when the battles of life come, remind yourself that the greater one lives in me. It's greater than every challenge. 
is greater than every mountain. It's greater than what is confronting your marriage. It's greater than what is afflicting your children. It's greater than whatever you may be going through right now. The greater one lives in me. So in Christ Jesus, through Jesus, by Jesus, we can become everything that God promised us. And that's his mind for us at this time. Let's burn our heads to pray. Start with a promise. Search out the land. Survive distractions. Slug it out. Today we have emphasized surviving distractions. There are so many distractions in today's world. There are too many alternatives now. You don't even have to go to church because you can watch online. You can flip channel to channel. You can, and so these are things distracting people. When the Bible says we should not neglect the assembly of ourselves together. Some people, because of alternatives they have on television or social media, they think they don't need to come physically. You see, those are distractions. Alternatives can distract us, we have seen. Is there anything distracting you now? Are you focused on the journey to your promised land? Where is your promised land? Do you know it yet? If not, like I said earlier, it might not be just one verse, but there can be a composite picture that will emerge as you spend time with God. And you know clearly this is God's destiny for me. This is the direction I'm supposed to go. It may not be a physical boundary like it was for Israel, but it's a place God has reserved for you. It's meant for you. And you are supposed to find it and live in it and enjoy it and be fulfilled in it and leave it behind for your children to enjoy. But you must fight the good fight of faith. You must fight the good fight of faith. Even in the Old Testament, that they fought physical battles, it still had to be by faith as we have seen. So, your own life, land now, are you fighting? If it's not a fight of faith, you are in the wrong fight. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your children. Fight for your career. Fight for your ministry. Fight for your business. In other words, find what God has to say about those things and take hold of that word and insist on it coming to pass in your life. Act like it is so. No devil can stop it. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We appreciate you for the place you are taking us individually and where you are taking us collectively as a people. We desire what you desire. We desire what you have in mind for us. Help us to recognize it and not to be distracted by anything that may look good or that may seem good. We are not satisfied with good ideas. We want God's ideas. We want your plans and purposes. Not what we think of or prefer because every land is not our promised land. Help us to walk with you because without you we can't get there. And thank you because we will survive distractions and we will fight the good fight of faith. And we know in advance that we have the victory. Thanks be unto God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If there be anyone now who has a challenge, we thank you because you have spoken already to them and they see what they need to do and thank you for grace to overcome. In Jesus' name. Do you have a challenge this morning? Will you like to stand in the light of God's word to us today? Will you like to speak to your challenge? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So faith does not deny a mountain, but faith can speak to the mountain. Is it against your health? Is it against your finances? Go ahead and speak in the light of God's word to us today. Go ahead and speak. We'll just agree with you. So it's by design that giants will try to stop you from getting to your promised land. Yeah, those giants are there. Something is occupying the place right now. You must dispossess it. So you must have a fighting spirit, but it's a fight of faith. Father, we believe your word. As your children have spoken in your ears, so will you do unto them. They know you can handle it, and they have brought the matters to you. They have spoken against those mountains, against those giants. And we thank you for the fall in the name of Jesus Christ. And thank you for your counsel. Your word says there's no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. Your word also says the counsel of the Lord that shall stand, many devices in the hearts of men. So your counsel for your Israel, your, your people in the New Testament, the things you promised, the things your word guarantees, they are the things we believe you for and receive right now. Thank you because it's so, not just in one case or two or three cases. In every case, 
to your glory and honor. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. The Bible says he sent forth his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Jesus is the living word. He didn't just take our sins on the cross. He took our sicknesses as well. But God's word has been spoken as it is written today. God's word is empowered by God. Every word of God is living and powerful. God's word is quick and powerful. That means his word is alive. His word can never return to him void. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. You are here today. You need healing for your body. Please stand to your feet. Lay your hand upon it. Expect to be healed. Because God's word has gone far. You need healing. Yes, stand. Lay your hand upon it. And say, Lord, I thank you because you are the Lord who heals me now. I receive healing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's plaguing you has a name. That's a name above every name. Thank you for the hands I laid on every part of the body. I rebuke every infirmity in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your power makes whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. As soon as somebody stood up ahead, stop drinking. So that person, I believe I know who you are, stop drinking. You are your own problem. Stop drinking. I don't know what, why a Christian should be drinking anyway. So stop drinking. Stop drinking. I would like to pray for you before I take my seat. If you are here today, you are not right with God. You want to be. You know you are not right with God. You want to be. When we were not serving God, we knew. When we started serving God, we knew. If you are here today, now, sometimes people deceive themselves because of religion. Religion can't say. You want to give your life to Jesus for real. You want to be born again. I want to pray for you. Every head bowed, every eye shut. Everyone pray. My knee is business. Just make it easy. Will you raise your hand and put it down if you are such a person? Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Or Pastor, pray for me. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Just lift your hand and put it down. If I see your hand, I know you want to be prayed for. God bless you. Every head is bowed, every eye is shut, just to make it easier for you. Not because it's something shameful. No. Any hand up? Please raise your hand above your head if you are raising your hand. Any backsliding Christian who wants to return to the Lord today? I can't see any hand yet. I'm about to take my seat. So if you are raising your hand, please raise it well. 